Matthew 24, verse 4, Jesus, when asked about the end times, the first words he spoke about it in verse 4 is, Take heed that no one deceives you. Uh, I do believe we're in the last days. Uh, and with that, so often people want to know, well, what's the sign of the last days? Well, uh, is being deceived uh, a bigger concern today <laughs> to you? Uh, we're in the information age, and it's harder to know the truth now than ever. Have mercy, Lord. And, and so our biggest thing, and, and this, this becomes very pertinent as we go along this path, is there's a lot you don't need to know. I don't need to know how my brain functions. I just need to use it. <laughs> you know, and I've seen some that evidently are waiting to figure it all out first. But there's a lot of things you don't need to know all the particulars to be able to do what you need to do. And, and with our series, our objectives have been threefold. One, to show how basic thoughts shape our world and public policy. Particularly, two primary concepts that virtually everybody believes one or the other. They, they might believe different forms of one or the other. But people either believe in creation or they believe in evolution. We either got here because God made us and put us here, or something happened, and now here we are. Everybody pretty much falls into one of those two, and that impacts how people think and process things. And it, it all really comes out of those two. It affects it. And probably everybody has a little bit of both in some way. You know, even if you believe in creation, that doesn't mean you're not influenced by the thought patterns of the other, and vice versa. Uh, but it's also to show that you don't need to have an intricate knowledge of issues to understand the principles that should guide policies. I'm talking about public policies. And, you know, I can look out from my office and see the interstate. I might not know where they're going. I might not know how far they're going to drive or the condition of their car. But I can tell whether they're going north or south. And there's a lot of things you might not be able to know and understand all the intricacies of it. But you can tell which way things are going. And you know enough to know that. Let me just throw one out here while I'm on my soapbox for the moment. But um, we, we've had people in the church. Actually, uh, my brother, thank God he's doing well. Uh, but... Uh, Last Saturday, uh, he was airlifted to MCV because there were concerns, and we got in the car, and we're heading down there, and then I realized we might not be able to get in. And so we called, and sure enough, they weren't going to allow us in to see him. And okay, I'm fine with that. I'm not immediate family. I mean, I'm his brother, but you know what I'm saying. And uh, But see, one thing, I've had a major issue through this whole COVID thing. See, if you had a six-year-old child and they had a problem, then you're supposed to hand them over to the doctor at the hospital and you go home. And that's happened to people. And I got big issues with that. That's going the wrong direction. Now, I, I don't plan on performing surgery on anyone. And you don't want me to. <laughs> but that's going the wrong direction. That I'm just supposed to trust people because they're an expert. I have someone that I know personally that was being taken into surgery. That the surgery was supposed to be for somebody else. And they were willing them into the operating room telling him, no, you, you just forgot we're doing this. 
He said, have you called my wife? They said, you're not married. He said, yes, I am. See this wedding ring? <laughs> well, he, he didn't do that. He was paralyzed. But somebody needs to be able to be there. And, and for that not to be the case, that's the wrong direction. And, and this, you know, the uh, teleconferencing for it, hogwash. If it's my kid, I want to be looking at him while we're talking. I understand the concerns, but find another way. But you don't take kids from their parents. Did you hear that phrase? And a lot of people in our country have no problem taking kids from their parents and letting other people decide what happens with them. Wrong direction. Amen. Anyway, let's go on. Now, we do have to have people that are specialized because, again, if you need surgery, it's not me. You need to have somebody that knows what they're doing. To implement a lot of things, we need to have people that are experts and knowledgeable in different fields. But when it comes to the basic policy that guides everything, you do not need to be a rocket science to know which way things need to go. That's just the facts. And also to encourage the body of Christ to become engaged in public policy. We're light and we're salt. And anywhere that we do not get involved... It goes dark and rots. Anybody think politics is a mess right now? How many of you think the political system is rotting? <laughs> and if you don't, well, we can pray for you later. But the church has largely left it up to other people. So what do you think it's going to turn out to be? You know, anyway. So uh, you need to learn foundational principles. You don't have to be a scholar. Just learn foundational principles. Do vote. If you're not voting, you need to repent. And I'll get to that later. <laughs> Seriously, you do. Uh, <laughs> and we will actually get to that later today. Uh, align with God's purposes and be a part of the solution. Now, very quickly, the seventh question is, what is the meaning of human history? Does it have a meaning? And we saw that the basic philosophy of evolution leads you to these conclusions. That the universe began out of chaos with a big bang. How many of you ever watched the TV show The Big Bang Theory? Okay, I actually like that show. I get a kick out of it. Because any show that has people, has characters on it that reminds me of people, I tend to like to watch them because I go, yeah, I know what that's like. <laughs> and, and so some of the Big Bang Theory, I, I know some people. And so I, I get a kick out of it. But you, you see, Evolution, excuse me, science is a wonderful thing. And it always makes me laugh, especially during this whole COVID thing. Oh, we just need to listen to science. Which side? That's right. Oh, science is very clear. Do what? you got experts on every side imaginable. There's virtually no, very little difference between science and religion. you got people with all different kinds of views. Uh, with a lot of things. And, and, and you see, science is probably one of the few categories. And, and I do love science. I like science. I did well in science um, uh, in school. Um, and I'm still fascinated by it. Um, but, you know, if you did watch The Big Bang Theory, if you didn't, eh, just hang on until I finish the story. But there's Leonard and there's Sheldon. And they're in this argument. And they're both, well, Sheldon is a theoretical physicist. Leonard, he, he, he proves theories. I forget what that's called, but anyway. Experimental physicist, thank you. And at that point, they're arguing. 
And Sheldon says he has proved string theory and you know the meaning of everything and, and so forth and so on. And then uh, Leonard looks at him and says, yes, but you had to create 23 parallel universes to prove it. Science is one of the few things that you can create something without any proof and it be accepted. You know, Einstein, and this does relate to what we're talking about. Just hold on, it's not just a TV show review. <laughs> Einstein, in his theory of relativity, actually did not like how it came out. So he added what is known, what he called, the cosmological constant. Just so it would come out the way he wanted it to, that he thought it should. Because without it, it left the conclusion that the universe would implode upon itself, basically. But all evidence then, and even today, shows, this is amazing, that the universe is continuing to expand at 186,000 miles a second. And, and here's the thing that a lot of times we don't realize. I, I was reading some stuff on this recently, that it's actually creating new galaxies and universes as it goes. Hallelujah. When God said, light be, it's still going and it's still creating. Hallelujah. And, and so eventually they thought, well, you know, that cosmological constant is just something he made up. Well, now, the scientists said, no, Einstein wasn't just making that up. He's actually right. The cosmological constant is dark matter. If you, how many of you are familiar with dark matter at all? Okay. <laughs> well, it's, an in, it's, a, it's another energy type thing. But now they're using this cosmological constant as this dark matter that, that is there that we can't really see. It's matter that you can't see. Sounds spiritual to me. Amen. And this is what keeps, this dark matter is what keeps all the world in place. The whole universe is held together by this dark matter. Hebrews chapter 1. He upholds all things by the power of His Word. See, what they don't realize is what they're finding out, what they're really seeing, is the power of His Word. And they, they see us there. There's something holding this all together. And they just, they just call it dark matter. They don't know what it is. It's the power of His Word. He holds all things together. This is one of the reasons I love science is because anything that is verifiable will always agree with the book. Always. Anyway, let's go on. But it, it came out of chaos with a big bang. It's developed randomly over billions of years. Slime plus time. It is continuing to evolve with humanity at the top of the evolutionary chain or ladder. Humanity has evolved to varying degrees. You know, some, you know, I can't believe somebody's still acting like that in the 20th century. In other words, the rest of us has been, have evolved and that knucklehead hasn't. <laughs> Evolution has little need for history because those who have gone before were more, more flawed and less developed than we were. So there isn't much that's useful. There's just some things maybe we could take and improve upon. History only has meaning that is relative to the level of development from that standpoint. So let's go to creation. Creation. You see, God had a plan when he created humanity. Human history is being guided, if you were, by Almighty God. He is not controlling every event of history but he is guiding the course of history. And it is going to come to a specific conclusion. You, you see, one of the things somebody says, well, you know, what if somebody blows up the world with a nuclear bomb? They're not. 
Well, how do you know? Because God said it was going to turn out different. A lot of people don't realize this. But during the 80s, there was a time that a glitch in the Soviet Union, in their program, identified that there were multitude of nuclear warheads heading toward Russia. And in their system, there was one guy that had to report it. And if he reported it, then they would act on it. If he didn't report it, nothing would be done. His only job was to report something he saw. All of this is happening. The guy is sitting there. All these nuclear warheads are coming in. It shows. Soviet soldier decides to not report. It ended up being a glitch from a storm that was happening. If he would have reported that and Soviet Union would have responded, nuclear war would have taken place. But the hand of God, I believe, was involved with that one man. Because history is not going to play out that way. That's not the way God said it's going to happen. God is directing the course of human history. He doesn't intervene on every situation unless asked. But there are events that if it would throw off his predestined course, he will intervene and prevent it. Thank you for your enthusiasm. But he has a plan. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 10. And if you would, you can look these up and we, we will just uh, go through this because i got a lot to say and uh, I'm slow doing it evidently. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. When did he choose us? Before he even made any of this stuff. God actually called out your name. Before he ever made the world. I choose Ray Eppert. See, you got to do something when you choose something. He called out my name. I wish he'd have said a different first name. But, <laughs> <laughs> but he knew what my parents were going to name. He called out your name. Before he ever made any of this. He mentioned you by name. He chose you. And he goes on. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, there's a day coming. He says that he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. All of human history is headed in a direction. Certain things are going to happen. A certain course of events is going to play out. Now there's a lot of variables in that in, in the meantime. But there are certain things that will happen that will cause it to end up at a particular destination. God has already laid it out. There is a destiny, if you would, for all of creation. Revelation 21, verse 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. You see, Einstein, in his theory of relativity, when he first did it back uh, somewhere 1915, 1917, somewhere through there, without that cosmological constant, it basically said it would continue to grow, and then it would finally implode upon itself. It would fold back up on itself. He had it right the first time. But you see, science thinks they know everything because it's just been expanding for billions and billions of years. But that doesn't mean it can't reach a point that it folds back up. And with that, what we've got to do is look at God. Hebrews again, chapter 1, tells us that He, in the beginning, created the world. And as a garment... He will fold them up. Hallelujah. This whole universe is going to fold back up at one point. And then he will unfold it again. And we will have a new heaven and a new earth. 
Glory to God. And there will be no more curse. Hallelujah for that. And you see, there's one big problem with creation for some people. There is an underlying implication. It is why many people, not all of them, not all of them, never assume that everybody that does something all have the same motives. A lot of times different people do the same thing as other people, but they do it for a different motive. But there are some that are wanting us to explore and find life anywhere outside of this planet because that will prove that God did not put us here. If there is life somewhere else, then we evolved. And life is evolving there. But if it's just us, then maybe God put us here. And if God put us here, I may be accountable to Him. I may have a level of accountability. And you see, one of the ways that you can tell people are guided by not good motives is when their principles change based on their circumstances. And you see, if they found a single-celled amoeba on anything outside of this planet, they would call it life. But today we even have those advocating that a baby can be killed even once it's born. It's not really a life yet. Strange definitions. Anything, single cell, life, it would be all over the papers. But it changes if there's another agenda. Because ultimately, both of them come down to one thing. I don't want to be accountable to God. That's, what, that's behind both of them. I don't want to be, and I'm not accountable to God. But you see, the facts are, creation is real. God made us. And as Hebrews 9.27 says, and I'm reading from the NIV, just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. We will all face a judgment. We all have accountability. And I probably talk about that more than most people realize. I just use different terms. Because the thing I want to do is I want to end up on the good side of that. See, judgment isn't just, isn't just bad. You, you know, I mean, when you have a, a contest, you know, I, I like... Uh, I like Andy Griffith, you, you know, and when they would, you know, the fair or whatever, everything, and uh, I won't use the pickle story for those of you that are familiar, but the pie-eating thing, the, the, the pie, well, it's a judgment on who wins. See, sometimes you come out of judgment, wonderful. That's what I want. At my judgment, I want to hear well done. Anytime I use that phrase that I want to hear well done, I'm talking about my accountability. But I'm not looking to be punished. I'm looking to get the good, good side. That's what I'm shooting for. That's what I'm aiming for. When, when I talked with my kids, when I would discipline them. Because they weren't always thrilled with it. One of the things I would tell them at times was, and, and this is true, I, I, I honestly believe this. I said, I firmly believe that one of the first things 
that God is going to ask me when I stand before him is, what did you do with those two boys I gave you? Did you do what you did for you? Or did you do it for me and for them? See, because sometimes I tell them, I say, it's actually easier for me to not discipline you. I could sit and watch the ball game and let you act like a nut. Because I don't want to be disturbed. But if I'm going to do my job, I got to get up. And I didn't always want to. Didn't always want to do it. But at that point, I'm accountable. I'm a steward over my children. When they're young and then they become their own steward and they're responsible for themselves. But I'm responsible to make sure that they're capable once they get to that place. To help prepare them. Now all along the way it's kind of a joint venture. But especially the early part, I'm leading it. And so there's accountability. I'm accountable for a number of things. You see, the question is, is what are we to give account for? And I firmly believe that every role that we have in life, we're accountable for it. I'm accountable as a husband. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting any different. Don't, I'm just trying to lighten it up a little bit. I, I'm accountable as a husband. I'm accountable as a father. I'm accountable as a friend. Now don't, don't get hyperactive uh, with your conscience. Well, I could have done this. I could. It's chill. Just... Stay in the middle of the road a little bit. Calm down. If your heart condemns you, see, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. There's things that you're going to miss all, all the time and you're going to look back and go, oh, man. You know, there's been times I've said something, found out later, I didn't realize that this person was going through that. And when I said that, that hurt them. I never did that with intent. I, I, I really didn't even ask God to forgive me because I didn't do it on purpose. Now, I might say something to them. See, there's a difference between apologizing to them and asking the Lord to forgive me. Because I didn't want to hurt them. And I was sorry that unintentionally I did. But I don't need to ask forgiveness for it because I didn't know it. And so you don't need to get a hyperactive conscience. You just didn't need to deal with the stuff you know. You know, you know not to look at him and go, you're an idiot. You might be worked up and do it, but you still knew it ahead of time that you shouldn't do it. You might have to walk out of the room to keep from it, but find a way. <laughs> but we're accountable. Friendships. We're, I'm accountable as a sibling. I have a sister and brothers. I'm accountable for that. There's different levels of all of those things. I'm accountable as a pastor. I, I'm accountable for not just when I teach, but the other parts of the work that I do, the more practical parts. I'm accountable for those things. You're accountable for your job and not just to the person who signs your check. You're accountable to God for your job. And that accountability is there. So what are we accountable? What, do, what are we to give account for? 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So it does have to do with what we do, good or bad. Now, good news, let me go ahead and give you this, because a lot of people preach this crazy. God's not going to bring up all your sins. He can't bring up stuff he's forgot. 
See what it basically is. I don't have time to go through the scripture right now. But God has a representation of your life. There's not an identifying this. This was for the lie you told on May 13th in 2012. No, it's just a representative type thing. Because God doesn't remember your sins and iniquities no more. Now I've heard people say, God's going to show a video of everything you've done. He ain't doing that. That would make judgment seem long for everybody. And it's not because of the time. But anyway, uh, we're, we're responsible for what we do. But there's something else. Because a lot of times people say, well, you know, I, I'm nice to people. Well, hallelujah, thank God you are. Better than being ugly to them and mean to them. But Matthew 25, 22, it's one of the lines from the parable of the talents. And it's referring to the one that had two talents. He also that had received two talents. Now this is a measure of money. Don't think singing or playing an instrument or writing. This is a measure of money. It's a resource. He who had received two resources came and said, Lord, you delivered unto me two resources, and behold, I have gained two other resources besides them. We're also responsible to give account for what he's given to us. And did we increase it? Isn't that what that's talking about? You gave me two, I'm bringing back four. I'm not doing Richard Nixon. I'm just two and two. Did I increase it? You gave me the ability to be a blessing to a couple people. I was. Because he says, if you'll be faithful over what is little, you'll be made rule over much. In other, bottom, in other words, the bottom line is, if you will use what he has given you he, faithfully, he will give you more to be faithful over. So in other words, God, the guy took the two and God blessed him and gave him more. That's that process. Now there was another guy that he got one resource and he buried it. Now I'll go ahead and throw this in. This is what I was talking about. If you don't vote, you need to repent. See, voting is a resource. That the fact that you are in this nation, this country, and you're a citizen, and you have the right to vote, that is a resource. But you can be like the one guy and go, I buried it. Last 30 years, I buried it. I ain't voted for nobody. All crooks. Well, might be. So your accountability is not for what they did with their resource. That's a different accountability. you just responsible for what you did with yours. See, I don't have to stand judgment for nobody but me. But I got to deal with what resources I have. What resources do I have? And you see, very often in our country, we just look, well, I'm always nice to everybody. I'm good. And we think that's the sum total of our accountability. And it's not. See, our founding fathers, they had no delusion that they had formed a perfect nation. Matter of fact, the only thing that they did do was they endeavored to base it on scriptural principles. When people talk about us being a Christian nation, it's not about people in the country being Christian. It's about the, the principles in which it was established. The, na the principles this nation was established on were Christian principles. Application is a whole different ballgame. But 
when they got around to doing the Constitution, and that went through various forms and so forth, the beginning of our current Constitution starts this way. The preamble says, We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. See, they looked at it as something they had to continue to develop. Not change the founding principles, but get the application to match the principles. See, the principles are good for everyone. But the application is not always applied to everyone. You see, here's where we are today. And this is what we've got to understand. If you look on social media, there's two primary groups. Those who want to prove they're right. Those who want to prove the others are wrong. And then some people like me on social media are doing nothing. Which will change, but it won't change in that way. Oh, um, but we're accountable for how we use our resources. See, I don't want to prove them right. I have been that way. I don't want to prove others are wrong. I have been that way. I have never wanted to do nothing. That's just not me. But I want to be part of a solution. And you see, part of where we start with that is with the simple words of Jesus. Where he said, talking about the greatest commandment, he said, the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, I do believe that there exists two types of people in our world right now. There are evil people, and some people would criticize me for believing that, but there it is. Amen. There are evil people. And there are people of goodwill. And there are people of goodwill on every side of every issue virtually. I believe, as going using the words of Jesus, I'll tell you what I want. And I believe all people of goodwill want the same thing. I want to be treated fairly in life. I do not intentionally want to be disadvantaged. I don't want to be targeted. I want my kids and my grandkids to have equal opportunity. And no one to make sure that they can't succeed. I won't, there's never a level playing field. Because we're born in different families with different backgrounds, with different resources. But I want equal opportunity. I want a general fairness. I want that for me. I want to be able to dwell safely. I want to live peaceably. I want that for me. I want that for my family. And if I'm doing what Jesus said, I want the same thing for you. I want the same thing for you. And that doesn't matter what color you are. doesn't matter what background you are. doesn't matter what doesn't matter any of that. 